Kovavak sat on the stone bench, enjoying the midday sun on his hide. Hot days like this helped him feel just a little younger than his 100 cycles. He looked up at the statue that never failed to move him. He remembers the day it was erected 60 cycles ago. The excited chattering of the next class drifted down the hall to him. This was his favorite part of the history class he taught. To most, it was just history, something that happened before their time, but to him, it was still alive in both his hearts. Come in and take a seat, hatchlings, raising his voice to be heard over the noise 30 hatchlings could make. Kovavak sometimes got irritated by how difficult it could be to quiet 30 students who were barely 10 cycles old. But then he remembered his childhood and how difficult it was. He preferred the happy chatter of the hatchlings over the fear and hopelessness when he was their age. Quiet down, hatchlings, looking sternly at them. So for today's lesson, I brought you to one of our people's most sacred monuments. He began to stroll to the statue before pointing at it. Who can tell me what this statue depicts? Kurnak, picking a student from the back row. Kurnak stood. It's a human-honored elder. Kovac nodded in approval. Very good, Kurnak. You may be seated. And who can tell me about the humans? His arms clasped behind his back as he turned to look at them. Rujdok. Rujdok rose and confidently stated, They are aliens, but my sire calls them just a myth, a legend. Kovavak looked out at the other students. How many of you agree that humans are a myth? Almost every claw shot up. Kovavak shook his head and thought to himself, Less than 90 cycles for real events to become a myth. That is incorrect, Rujdok. Your sire is quite wrong, turning to look up with reverence. I was there when the humans appeared to us, saved us. An excited buzz coursed through the class. Several students asked questions at the same time. Really? Were humans as tall as the statue? You know, where are they now? Did you meet any? Kovavak held up a claw to quiet them. Yes, I was there when the humans came. He took a moment to gather his thoughts. I wasn't much older than you are now, when we still lived on Korthen. Another excited buzz at the mention of their former homeworld. The young grew up on tales of life before they had to leave the planet. To the young, it was so long ago that they forgot some Kexians were still alive from that time. Kovavak stood in front of them. There was no Kexian Republic then, and we'd only recently left our world for the stars. We'd established a few colonies on our moons, but couldn't even explore our entire system yet. My sire was a member of the ruling Council of Elders. Kovavak still felt proud of his sire. We sent messages to the stars, wondering if we were alone. We made first contact with the Cumerians, and from them we learned of many other races. Small groups of aliens came to trade and welcome us to the galactic community, one of which was the humans. Unlike most aliens, they were fair in their dealings with us. It was one of their laws when it came to interacting with those races new to the stars. Kovavak continued, We traded for new technology, including new tools to examine our system and to explore our world. It was one of these new devices that warned us of the danger building inside our second moon, Pataxirk. As always, a rush of memories came to Kovavak when he taught this lesson. What was the danger? One of the students exclaimed. Kovavak hit a smile as he replied, I will tell you in a moment. Be patient. Pressure was building to an extremely high level, and there was concern it would endanger our science outpost there. Kovavak took a breath. We didn't think big enough that it would crack our moon and send chunks of it to our homeworld. At first, our scientists just studied the changes, but things changed once they saw the fault lines beginning to widen, and then the moonquakes became more frequent, more intense. They sent messages to scientists of various races, and they warned us it was just a matter of sub-cycles before it cracked wide open. And then they told us it would most likely destroy our planet when the huge chunks hit the surface. Our other moon couldn't sustain life. It was just another outpost, Kovavak said. Kovavak remembered the looks on the faces of the adults, the hushed whispers and discussions about what to do. We were still new to space and had very few ships capable of leaving our system. We needed help if we were to survive. Messages were sent to all the races we'd met. He still remembered his sire's anger, but they either ignored us or offered to sell, rent their ships for an exorbitant amount. A few offered us shelter, but in return, we'd be like slaves for them. Kovac still loathed the Kessinit for that so-called offer. We'd just about given up on help from other races and they made plans to get as many out as possible. Kovac enjoyed how engrossed the students were in his tale. We had no idea that someone answered our call, but... The humans did. A massive fleet arrived, thousands of ships of all sizes. Warships, transports, luxury liners, cargo haulers, and shuttles by the hundreds to move us from the planet to the ships. The humans apologized for taking so long to get there. My sire calculated how long it took to travel from Korthen to the humans' home system. They'd left less than a rotation after they got our message. Looking at his students' faces, 
he remembered having that same look of astonishment. Kovova continued, Now humans were known to be efficient, but the level of their preparation was beyond belief. They knew just how many of our people could fit per ship with our most necessary possessions. Teams of humans worked with our people to dismantle our most important buildings. Temples, factories, space launching facilities, monuments, schools, and others were just torn down for the material. Samples of native flora and as much fauna as they could safely catch were taken aboard explorer ships set up to do just that. Surprisingly, they managed to get samples of almost all flora and large numbers of wild fauna. All the wild animals you see in the parks and wild are from our home planet. It still left Kovac in awe at just how much they did in such a short time. They'd even completely evacuated and removed our outposts on both moons and extracted large amounts of our resources for our use in rebuilding. Kovac smiled as he teased the students. Remember that when you complain, it takes too long to clean your dens. Kovac carried on with the tale. They did this without stopping for 10 rotations. They took us to a planet they'd been terraforming for their use, but hadn't occupied yet. We got another surprise when we landed and found another large group of humans had been putting up temporary shelters for us. Holes had been dug to transfer the water from our planet to save on the time it can take to have enough for all of us and our animals. Until the moisture processors can supply enough to create all the lakes and some of the rivers you see now. With this world being much closer to Corthon, they were able to make multiple trips back and forth. All of our people, except the ones that stayed to help, were transferred here in less than eight rotations on Corthon. That would be six rotations here. My sire was one of the volunteers and told me they worked until almost the last minute before it happened. Kovovac vividly remembers the sorrow in his sire's voice as he described the death of our world. I was with my sire when the Council of Elders met with the humans that had been in charge of the evacuation. Kovovac continued, the elders asked how they should repay the humans for their help, and one of them made a joke. He said, it was traditional to repay someone with pizza and beer when they help you move. We were confused, but all the humans laughed at that. Kovovac followed up by explaining it was a joke. They asked for nothing but our friendship, and to not be like the races that refused or tried to take advantage of us. Humans stayed two cycles to help us get our civilization in order again. Cities were built, flora planted, and then wild fauna released. Kovovac said, they even helped us establish and build a fleet of our ships, not just military, but civilian and exploration vessels. Our warships are only slightly modified from the designs the humans gave us. Kovovac finished with, humans are real and we owe them a great debt. The students began talking excitingly about the lessons before one student raised a claw. Yes, hey, talk? Kovovac was sure what the question would be. They always asked eventually. An honored elder, if the humans are real, then why haven't we seen them? Hey, talk queried. They were betrayed, Kovovac stated simply. Many of his students gave an audible gasp at this statement. Several students spoke out with questions that all amounted to the same thing, who betrayed them and how. That will be fully explained at a later date, but to summarize, Kovovac took a sip from the container of water, where he kept it on his belt. 29 cycles after we arrived on this world, a new race entered our galaxy. They were almost as malevolent as they were powerful, and they announced their arrival by destroying eight colonies from various races, Kovovac said. The only reply they gave to calls sent to them was simply, submit or die. But that was a lie. Kovovac took another sip. He always needed fluids by the end of the lessons, from all the talking. He continued, a Berithian colony surrendered to them, and they still destroyed it. They enslaved some of the people, but they exterminated others in horrific manners. An object lesson, they said, the humans were furious, the Berithians were a peaceful people, and not very numerous, Kovovac said. I asked one why they reacted that way, and he replied, we don't like bullies, especially when they target our friends. So the humans called for war against the new race. We didn't even know their name. Kovovac shook his head in disgust. The Great Council argued over it. Some assumed they would only attack the lesser races and leave them alone. Others wanted to keep trying the diplomatic route. Others agreed, but would only protect their space. Ourselves and over a half dozen smaller races answered the humans' call, but we could only muster 60 real warships between us. Where the human ambassador had raged at the more powerful races, he warmly welcomed us to join the effort. The only one of the most powerful races, the Kithranka, promised support. But being on the other side of the galaxy, it would take some time to get a fleet to human space. It was at this point that the human ambassador shamed the rest of the council by saying they didn't need them. They'd just be in the way, and promptly exited the chambers with us joining him. Kovovac kept on with the story. The Kithranka ambassador barely said anything before he nodded at us and left to contact his govet. The human ambassador thanked us for being loyal friends 
and got us in contact with their fleet command. Another student raised a claw. Then what, did we fight? Kovovac proudly replied, Yes, we did. I was serving on one of our cruisers and made sure I got to go help our friends. The humans only requested five ships from each of us. They didn't want us defenseless. So we joined with the humans' armada. It was far larger than the one that saved us, and it was all warships. Hmm. I was told there were over 100,000 ships of various sizes, from massive carriers to small starfighters. But the enemy brought more and bigger ships. Images of the chaos of battle filled Kovovac's head before he continued. The humans had us in reserve to counter their flank attack. I'd never even heard of a battle this massive, let alone seen. Kovovac's hearts began beating faster as he remembered the terror and exhilaration of the fight. The humans drove straight into the center of the enemy's formation. It was so chaotic that it was almost impossible to tell friend from foe. Another student spoke up. But what about you and our ships? Kovovac continued. We did as asked and attacked any ships that got around the flanks, mostly fighters and destroyers. But we did have to gang up on a large cruiser, too. And after three quarters of a rotation, the battle was over. Kovovac looked at each student. Only a few of the enemy escaped and none of their capital ships. But the humans paid a very heavy price for victory. 80% of their fleet was destroyed and the rest heavily damaged. All but a dozen capital ships were floating wrecks. Our little squad only lost three ships destroyed with the rest damaged in one way or the other. The human casualties were in the millions, dead, wounded, or missing. Kovovac looked at the scars on his right arm from an exploding console after a massive hit. And the next two rotations were spent rescuing survivors from wrecks and sending wounded to hospitals all over their space, including our wounded. Unlike other races, the humans didn't differentiate in treating their wounded and their allies. Kovovac continued, Aside from the Zathrex, we went to the same hospitals as their wounded. The Zathrex could only go on a special hospital ship that would take them home since their biology made it difficult to treat in a standard human med facility. But the humans treated them as a priority to get home. A small Kithranka fleet arrived a rotation after the battle. Only 25 smaller ships that had been on convoy duty were much closer than the home fleets. They were sent ahead of the others. Is that how they were betrayed? That the others didn't show up? A student named Ponka asked. No, the enemy did not take their defeat lightly, and they launched antimatter torpedoes into the stars of systems inhabited by human colonies. Even the human's home system was targeted and their cradle world was destroyed, Kovovac replied, unable to keep the sadness from his voice. The betrayal came from one of the races on the council, either scared of the enemy or angry at the humans that relayed the location of all the humans' major colonies. Another student, San Ajsi, asked, Who did that? Kovovac answered, We don't know. But since the location of one of the destroyed human military bases was known only to less than a dozen races, someone gave it up. So that killed all the humans? Kovovac didn't see which student asked. No. Less than a million humans survived on a few minor colonies and stations, Kovovac continued. They spent the next 10 cycles rebuilding their military and constructing five massive motherships. The humans wanted revenge, and they were going to find the enemy's space and finish what they started. Kovovac took another sip, and so all but a few humans left this galaxy to take war to the enemy. The ones that stayed all died eventually, so we built this statue to remember them and their friendship with us. Kovovac finished. And now, my inquisitive little hatchlings, the lesson is over, and it's time to go home. It was just days after the destruction of Earth and her many colonies and outposts. The cataclysm, as it became known, had nearly extinguished humanity's spark from the universe. Billions and billions died, but some survived less than one million souls, grieving the loss of their friends, their families, their homes, their species, and Earth. Billions of years of the evolution of life were destroyed in hours. 99% of Earth's flora and fauna were gone forever. Even those seated on the colony worlds were exterminated. So the call went out and the last vestiges of humanity gathered on one of the few worlds to escape destruction, only escaping destruction because it was in the last stages of terraforming. Expeditions were sent to retrieve pieces of Earth and the other destroyed colonies, a memorial for the dead and a promise of revenge. The survivors came and held ceremonies for all they lost, and then they swore revenge. They swore to track down the enemy and teach them their mistake, the mistake of not completely exterminating humanity. They left some alive and filled them with a terrible thirst for revenge, one that could only be sated by the extermination of the enemy. The enemy left more than 150,000 wrecks after their defeat. It took years to gather it all, examine it, and disassemble ships for study. Never before had humans been so focused on a task. They salvaged everything from the battlefield, Terran, and alien. 
all but a few of mankind's remaining outposts were dismantled. The broken remnants of both fleets were scrapped and used in the construction of the five massive motherships and in rebuilding the human navy. It was a tremendous undertaking to construct the biggest starships in this galaxy. Examining, deciphering, and reverse engineering the enemy's tech had advanced humanity's technical knowledge by leaps and bounds. Examining the enemy bodies revealed them to be genetically engineered clones. They averaged two meters in height and 135 kilograms in weight with four arms, two of which ended in hands of four fingers and two thumbs. The other ended in a nasty set of claws. Their four eyes were set above a muzzle that held an impressive number of sharp fangs. Auditory openings were located on the neck and the olfactory were under the jaw. Their cranium was thick with a small crest down the middle. They were bipedal with legs that bent backward like a horse. Their feet ended in six toes with talons that were curved in such a way as to rip the target's flesh off when kicked. Their body was covered in multiple plates of a black, chitinous form of armor. The navigational data gave them descriptions of tens of thousands of stars and millions of planets, moons, and other astral phenomena. It allowed them to locate the wormhole that connected the Milky Way to the Andromeda Galaxy. It showed the locations of several more, but the most coveted information had not been found yet the location of the enemy's home or their name. So the humans just called them the Wraith. The name was taken from a fictional evil alien race in a 21 Saint century TV show. The information gleaned from their ships and equipment allowed the humans to completely revamp their starship design. New pilot neural interfaces allowed smaller crews per ship. The reduction in crew space left more room for armor, weapons, or sensors. Humanity's centuries of fascination with the sci-fi genre was invaluable. It inspired new ideas to explore the limits of what they knew. The limited numbers of humans meant not only did quality need to outweigh quantity, but everything created needed to maximize the potential of individual humans. Books, short stories, games, movies, TV shows, and even animation inspired new ideas. Not all were useful. Transporters were not possible with current tech, but power armor, mechs, weapons, and 100 other ideas. Destroyers now needed just a single pilot, cruisers three, and capital ships two dozen. Only the carriers had a large crew, but where it had needed thousands, it took hundreds. The combining of human and wraith technology allowed for ships faster, tougher, and far more deadly than what the wraith encountered in the Milky Way. For 10 long years, humans worked tirelessly mining materials for their great ships. Food was grown and preserved in millions of tons, until finally they were ready. The revenge, the vengeance, the reckoning, the retribution, and the avenger were fit for launch. 10 kilometers long, 6 kilometers wide, and 3 kilometers tall. Each ship could hold 10 times the number of humans still alive, from a race that numbered in the tens of billions to now just over a million men, women, and children. Giant facilities turned out the weapons humanity needed from small arms to mechs to warships. Docking ports allowed the capital ships to ride the motherships, like remoras to a massive shark. Massive hangars held fighters, destroyers, and cruisers. In a matter of moments, a fleet of five could become a fleet of 5,000. Thousands of weapon systems dotted the hulls, from standard railguns and missile batteries to massive plasma cannons that could devastate a planet, and everything in between. It was then that humanity left the galaxy of their birth and began the great hunt. From this moment on, there were only two options left, victory or death. Aboard his flagship Revenge, Admiral Tanaka stood over the tech's shoulder as the fleet entered a new system. It was his ritual to look and to think, let this be the one. For 30 long years, the humans prowled the stars in search of their prey. And for 30 long years, they'd only found signs of their activities, but not them. Dead worlds, planets split into hundreds of floating rocks, or the remains of extinct civilizations. They'd stop and explore the last, looking for signs of their foe. Six months here, a year there, gathering resources needed for the journey, never forgetting their oath given to their dead. Humanity had thrived during the journey. There were over five million of them now. One of the technologies they discovered and improved upon was cold sleep. This let humanity conserve resources during the trip and keep their forces at prime readiness. Only one quarter were out of cold sleep for a year. Pregnant women and children under 15 were excluded. The Admiral turned to look at asked, Captain Isle, status of the fleet? Captain Isle double-checked his console before replying, All present and accounted for. Thank you, Captain. Deploy recon units and assume defensive formation, the Admiral acknowledged. The bridge crew worked with the efficiency their search had provided. Basic data rolled in immediately. Number of plants and moons, other celestial bodies present, and distances from the flagship's current position. So when an excited voice called for the Admiral's attention, everyone focused on her. 
Admiral, Recon 7 reports enemy contact at the fourth moon of the fifth planet. Admiral Tanaka externally kept up a calm demeanor, but inside he was shouting with joy. Finally, you bastards. Focus, Ensign, and remember your training, the Admiral reminded her. I need more info. The Ensign looked abashed, but continued to relay incoming info. Yes, sir. Sorry, sir. Her voice steadied. Recon 7 states an enemy fleet of approximately 120 ships. They are continuing to gather intel on types and more exact numbers. Long-range sensors also detect a large debris field in the area of the fleet. Recon 7 says there appears to be weapons fire directed at the planet, she finished. The Admiral gave her shoulder a gentle squeeze to let her know how well she'd done. Thank you, Ensign. When the Admiral turned to face Captain Isle, the look they gave each other conveyed their agreement. Captain, inform the fleet of the situation. Do you concur we have sufficient force currently available to engage the enemy? Yes, Admiral. Before continuing, as long as there aren't any more in the system or reinforcements, join them. Admiral Tanaka thought for a moment before answering. Begin revival procedures, non-combatants, transfer to the Avenger, and retribution. He then turned to one of the communication techs. Switch to the fleet-wide channel, if you please. This channel allowed the Admiral to directly address every ship in the fleet and over the mothership's internal comm systems. When the tech gave a nod, the Admiral spoke into the handset. Attention the fleet. We've found an enemy force and our revenge starts today. We've spent decades working to this moment and we are ready. Admiral Tanaka had waited decades to say this. Battle stations, let's fuck them up. Captain Isle looked at the Admiral with a raised eyebrow, to which the Admiral responded with a boyish grin and a laugh. What? I couldn't think of anything else. The bridge crew laughed before turning to their stations and starting the process of bringing the fleet to full combat readiness. Returning to seriousness, he spoke to the bridge crew. I want all the Avenger and Retribution and their ships to hang back in reserve. The Vengeance and Reckoning to join us in engaging the enemy fleet. Admiral Tanaka continued. I want all ships crewed and ready for the launch the second we land behind the enemy. Klaxons sounded throughout the massive ships, joined by the sounds of boots pounding on metal as crews ran to their stations. Shuttles ferried the non-combatants to the Avenger and Retribution, while the process of awakening the personnel in cryosleep began. It seemed like forever, but in less than 15 minutes, the fleet was ready for combat. Captain Isle confirmed this. Admiral, fleet signals readiness. Non-combatants have been transferred. All ships and guns are manned, and defensive measures are at maximum efficiency. Very good, you Captain. Let it begin. Captain Isle turned and gave the long-awaited order. Signal the fleet to jump. The quick burst of FTL put them in range of the enemy between one heartbeat and the next. The Admiral glanced at the tactical officer, who replied with a nod that all three ships had hit the mark. Launch all ships. Revenge, Vengeance, and Reckoning are to engage their capital ships, dreadnoughts, and carriers to assist. All other ships engage the subcapital ships. The Admiral gave a predatory grin before giving the long-awaited order. All batteries, open fire. Untold numbers of Wraith died before they even knew what happened. The sheer power of the opening volley turned dozens of ships into floating wrecks, while others ceased to exist entirely. Decades of righteous fury were unleashed upon humanity's most hated foe. What happened next wasn't a battle, it was a massacre. While humanity's tech level had advanced at a rapid pace, the enemies had not. Terran weapons tore through armor and shields with minimal trouble, but Wraith return fire caused limited damage. It took less than 10 minutes to completely obliterate every Wraith vessel. The bridge crew gave a huge cheer before tech interrupted. Admiral, weapons fire detected on the moon's surface. Wraith have landed troops and are engaging the locals. Admiral Tanaka gave back a nod. Thank you. Relay all relevant intel to General Garcia. The Admiral contacted the General. Did you catch all that, General? General Garcia replied, Yes, Admiral. Intel coming in now. Excellent. You may drop when ready, said the Admiral before following up with, Good luck, Juan. Kick their ass and take no prisoners. The General had a huge grin as he answered, With pleasure. It took only moments for the landing ships to launch and streak toward the surface. Communications broadcast on all frequencies we are here to assist against the enemy. And then the Admiral looked at another officer. Check our database for any info on the locals, especially language. General Garcia and his troopers had a rough ride to the surface, but they wouldn't have missed it for the world. At two kilometers, designated ships began to launch 150 drop troops in power armor. They had limited flight capabilities, enough to get them down safely and maneuver easier on the ground. Firing on the way down, they hit the LZ and began securing it for the landing ships. Alerted by the loss of their fleet, the Wraith sent a force to engage the unknown attackers. They didn't send enough. 1,000 Wraith walked into a buzzsaw. They went down before they could even contact their commanders. A few humans walked among the carnage and administered the coup de grace to those still breathing. While that was being done, 
the landing ships disgorged massive mechs, armor, and ground pounders in augmented body armor. Scouts were sent out in a 360-degree circle to examine the enemy forces. General Garcia checked his watch. Ready reaction force on the ground and ready for action in 20 minutes. Not bad. The general keyed his chin mic. All units, I want weapons and armor checks done. You got 10 minutes. He looked over at his mechs and armored vehicles. When checks are finished, mount up and prepare to move out. 10,000 human fighters prepared to start their campaign of revenge. His scouts began feeding him intel of destroyed villages, dead civilians, and soldiers with only a few dead wraith. The locals were heavily outmatched by the enemy. Then, the scouts were sent towards the large settlement they'd seen as they landed and reported a large enemy force was engaged with the locals, and the locals were about to be overrun. He beckoned over a nearby officer before speaking. Toby, load up your troops and drop between the enemy and the locals. Buy us some time to engage their rear. Captain Asim saluted and ordered his power armor to load onto their dropships and be ready to drop. Group leader Hamilak peered over the lip of the trench, watching the Pachial advancing on his position. They didn't know their name, so his people just called them doom from above. Hopelessness was beginning to overwhelm the last of his surviving troops, but they could not run and leave all the civilians to the tender mercy of the enemy. So they stood their ground, exchanging fire in a futile attempt to keep them from the settlement behind them. Every moment they held the enemy back, bought with blood and death, was another for the civilians to reach the vast worn of underground tunnels and bunkers. One of his soldiers exclaimed, Group leader! before pointing to the sky. Hamalak looked at the spacecraft flying in his direction. His shoulders slumped as he saw his impending doom flying in his direction. So imagine his surprise when the ships turned and flew parallel to his trench line. They shot fire into the mass of Pachel, while some sort of bipedal being dropped from the ship and landed on thrusters of fire. He saw it was some sort of armor, but of a type he'd never heard of. Black with four appendages, two legs, and two arms. It had some sort of rifle in its hands and that pack that let it drop safely to the ground. The helmet completely covered what he assumed was the head. The mysterious aliens turned and engaged the enemy. One of them turned towards him and pointed to itself and then its weapon and then the enemy. It then pointed at him and then to the settlement. It took a moment for Hamalak to understand, but then figured it out. He spoke into his communicator. All units fall back to the village and regroup. The alien units will cover our retreat. Hamalak and his soldiers grabbed their wounded, climbed out of the trench, and ran for the village as fast as their forelegs could go. They took cover in the buildings that gave the best protection without sacrificing their line of fire. General Garcia watched the feed from the helmet cams of several of his troops in power armor. He estimated at least 40,000 wraith, arrayed in formations of around 10K each. Only one formation was attacking the settlement and was now being engaged by his troopers. Snipers and scouts effectively eliminated all of the wraith sentries they could locate. It was a complete surprise when they attacked the rear of the enemy formation. Railguns, autocannons, missiles, plasma, and metal projectiles in the thousands tore into the unprepared ranks of the hated foe. Mechs and some armored units remained to hold the rear while his infantry and the rest of the armored units began to flank the wraith on both sides. As reports came back, General Garcia thought to himself, got my own canny in the making. Maybe I'll have them call me Hannibal from now on. Just like in space, the Wraith were unprepared for the new human technology. The human losses were minimal, and most of those were just wounded. Once he got word, both sides had met up with the power armor units. He gave the order, advance and no mercy. From his new position, group leader Hamalak watched as the new aliens charged into the horde of Pachial. They fought with a fury, unlike anything he'd ever seen. The armored soldiers weren't content to just shoot at the enemy, but they charged into the middle of them firing their weapons, slashing with some sort of blades that extended from the forearms, or just punching, kicking, and stomping on the Pachial. And before long, none of the Pachial were still standing. Some aliens were walking through the carnage and finishing the surviving Pachial. A pair of aliens walked up to Hamalak, and by how others responded, it must be the leader. The pair removed their helmets and looked at Hamalak before saying something in their language. He couldn't understand their words, but studied them curiously. They had two eyes, two ears, a mouth, what he guessed was a nose and a small bit of fur on the top of their head. Their flesh was two different colors. He was inspecting their armor when his superiors arrived and gladly let them take over this first contact. The first shots of humanity's war of retribution had been fired. The first victory was won and the first new allies were found. Many more of both would happen before the resolution of the humans' promises to their dead were honored. But those tales are for another time.